Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of What's Happening. I'm George Binns, and the guest on the return engagement is Brendan Sweeney, who is running for city councilor at large for the city of Beverly. And uh, nowadays, that's getting to be a much more complicated uh, race because both Paul Guanzi and uh, Tim Flaherty have announced that they are not running for re-election. So mm. there are, I think there's four people now that have taken out papers and that'll probably drag in another crowd. So it'll get to be an interesting race. Well, Brendan, so uh, as we started talking earlier, you're kind of the new kid in town. Uh, yep. You moved to Beverly for a reason and you've obviously thought that this is a good place to live. So share with us, why do you like Beverly? Yeah, thanks, George. Uh, thanks again for having me back on the show here. And so, as I had mentioned last time, I'm from the North Shore originally. Uh, I was born in Beverly Hospital. I moved around a little bit as a kid, uh, but ultimately my family settled in Ipswich. And so I knew after graduating from Gordon College, uh, not too far down the road, that I did want to stay in the North Shore. Um, and Beverly was really appealing. It's a city that I got to know well uh, when I was in college for a multitude of reasons. Um, one, we have the natural beauty of every other town on the North Shore. That's one thing that appealed to me in Ipswich was being right on the water with the beach. Uh, Beverly obviously has that asset. We have a beautiful waterfront, uh, numerous parks and beaches. Um, but what Beverly offers that a town like Ipswich doesn't um, was really accessibility to Boston. That was huge um, with the multitude of commuter rail stations that we have in the city, uh, particularly the depot. That was very appealing for me, but also um, a walkable downtown with a whole variety of cultural attractions between the theater that we have downtown, um, the numerous coffee shops and restaurants. Um, it was really a pretty easy choice for me um, graduating from college to stay in the area and pick Beverly as where I wanted to settle. Um, but then longer term, um, my fiance and I were recently engaged and it was a pretty easy decision for us when mapping out our longer term future of where we wanted to stay to narrow Beverly as a pretty um, great place to raise a family and one that we wanted to commit to because the town has a great school system. Um, you still have all of those amenities that we talked about um, being able to access a more lively downtown than other places on the North shore within Beverly, uh, that accessibility of Boston, it's really tough to beat um, the many great assets we have, both natural assets, cultural assets, the small business community. Um, we really are, as I like to say, a city unmatched anywhere else in the Commonwealth. So it sounds like uh, if you get elected to the city council, you're gonna be all in favor of more of the same, only do it better as opposed to do it different. Am I reading you right? Um, I guess it would depend on what in particular you were talking about. I think the one thing that makes Beverly really unique and this, so like on a project basis is where you would have to evaluate whether we do more of the same or something different. Um, to further elaborate on that, the one thing that Beverly makes Beverly more unique than Salem or some of the other cities that are between here and Boston because Beverly has a mix of, as I mentioned, of you know, a vibrant downtown area um, with the depot and all of the small businesses that we have that line Cabot and Rantoul. Um, but we also have sections of the city that are more residential and have more of the small town New England feel. And throughout the city, we still have the historic character that Beverly as you know, one of the many mill towns in New England has. Um, and when you think about more of the same, I think the first thing that popped into my head that probably was what you were referring to, George, is a lot of the development that took place on the end of Rantoul Street uh, yeah. leading down toward the bridge. I do think one thing that is very important regionally and particularly in Beverly is we want to make sure that we have an adequate housing supply. And so those projects did meet that need. That being said, when we think about what's next, I think of areas like uh, the Bass River, the area between the depot train station in the river itself as um, an area that I would like to see smaller scale mixed use development that meets some of the more reasonably priced housing options that I think our city lacks and could use more of that would be best served in smaller multifamily units 
as opposed to six story apartment buildings to fit with the natural character of the area being right on the river, but more so with Beverly's historic character as a smaller city, as opposed to being a city like Cambridge or Somerville, where you end up ultimately just becoming a satellite of Boston. I don't see that as Beverly's future. Um, so I do think we need to build off of the growth that we've seen over the last 10 years or so. But again, that is where looking at each specific project makes a difference. There is no one size fits all model for development in Beverly that you know, might make sense for a portion of Rantoul Street downtown, but wouldn't make any sense if you tried to apply that same model to Beverly Farms or one of the smaller neighborhoods on the outskirts of the city. Well, that gets into the interesting question of what is the character of Beverly and the way you're describing it, it's kind of mixed in yeah, that. I would say so. Downtown looks like a suburb of Boston and it's going to be that way because of the uh, condos and the apartments and the question comes in, do we expand that to uh, Cabot Street? Uh, and at the same time, how do you protect the farms and uh, Pride's Crossing and some of those areas that are much more rural? They're not, no, they're not farms anymore, but uh, yeah, it's a mm -hmm. urban area uh, where people have really relatively large lots and single family homes. Yep. And in between those two combinations, I think what you're saying is uh, we've got to develop a, a different kind of housing model for the people that can't afford the farms and uh, that really don't want to live in a condo or an apartment on Rantoul Street. So how, do, how does the city maintain this character? So I think you hit on a really important piece there, which is we need to make sure that we have an adequate housing market across demographics to meet the various needs of our city. Um, I think when you look at Beverly right now, you mentioned there's you know, single family homes, some more expensive, some, well, nowadays with the way the housing market is, everything is expensive as yeah. far as buying a home in Beverly, but some on the real high end, other homes that would otherwise be considered starter homes are still very expensive nowadays. I can speak personally as a younger resident, my fiance and I have begun to plan, you know, we'd like to buy a home. Unfortunately, with the price of housing, that's not as attainable for somebody in my demographic as it would have been 10 years ago. Um, but so one thing that I think we could focus on on the housing front is targeting the term that I've been using is workforce housing. Essentially, it's more middle income housing opportunities for the folks that are making, you know, within that 50 to $100,000 range that wouldn't otherwise qualify for the state mandated affordable housing that we have met. Mandate is 10% of your housing stock is affordable. Uh, we're at 12% right now, um, but otherwise wouldn't be able to buy a home. And so what I like is a development model. And I think the master plan, uh, Plan Beverly was the name of the plan that just was recently put forward in through 2019 into 2020. Um, I think it does a good job of illustrating this idea that we need to think of mixed use development as a way to bring forth either revitalizing older underutilized properties or building new properties that still fit within the character of a neighborhood, meet commercial need, whether that's a storefront or more of a professional services type of business that's less outward facing, but still meets a key employment need in our city. And then also can contain some of these units that would ideally, by virtue of the makeup and I mean, there's still challenges with just an expensive housing market overall. But what I would hope is that some of those units that are within these mixed use developments begin to meet that need for middle income workforce housing that the city otherwise doesn't have, as you mentioned, George, between the single family homes that are getting exceedingly expensive and some of either the affordable housing unit, or also if you look at some of the units on Rantoul Street, those aren't anything but affordable. And at the end of the day, I think an increase in housing in the city will ultimately be good to allow for more housing options. But unless we target development toward that middle income community, then we're gonna leave a big group of our city's demographic behind. And that's a voice that I think I can represent being a member of a demographic that to me seems to be made up of young professionals, working class families and seniors that would like to downsize, but can't find an affordable option in Beverly to do so. Yeah, that's, that's a common theme that keeps coming up of mm -hmm. um, 
we have quote affordable housing according to the state, but it's not housing that people can afford, not the people mm -hmm. that work here. And at the same time, uh, I think the Cummings Center and Cummings in general is doing a marvelous job between uh, taking over the old shoe and developing yeah. the Dunham Ridge. And where do those people that work there live? Do they have to commute from, you know, across the border from New Hampshire in order mm -hmm. to afford something? And uh, I had a discussion with one of your potential compatriots, Todd Rotondo, and he and his mm -hmm. brother owned a duplex. Now, I mean, that's one of the ways classically that uh, middle income people developed wealth and established themselves in a the community. Mm -hmm. You buy a, a duplex or a double decker or a triple decker and uh, you rent out half or a third, two thirds of it. And that helps you meet the mortgage payments. And eventually over time, uh, you end up with some sort of reasonable wealth position that you can mm -hmm. retire with and so forth. And the question comes down to is uh, with a zoning of uh, like in my neighborhood, it's uh, 10,000 square feet per lot. Yeah. And, you know, it, around here, the uh, an average lot is, well, not an average lot. Uh, if I look at the uh, assessment on my house uh, and expand it to the uh, full uh, acre, it's over a million dollars an acre. Uh, and you can't afford to put a really inexpensive house on something like that. So how do we get around that kind of a zoning problem? So I think there's two things that you mentioned here. First with the zoning, and you really did a good job of illustrating what I would like to see as that duplex and triple decker, triple decker sorry, model for how we can build multifamily housing so that we're you know, essentially getting the bang for our buck as far as the amount of housing units per land that we're actually building on, um, while still not overdeveloping Beverly and keeping that smaller town feel in some of the neighborhoods where I think we could incorporate this model more successfully um, as a great way to meet the working class, um, young professional demographic. I would, you know, like you mentioned, that model to build wealth would be something that if I could afford to do is a great opportunity to do so. Um, the zoning thing, I think what we really want to look at is getting creative with where, and I think this is primarily where the city is zoned industrial or other kind of somewhat outdated uses for the property, where we can rezone an area and the Bass River is, you know, obviously the first one that jumps into my mind, rezone an area with kind of a forward thinking vision of what would we like to see that area become as we are going through the initial rezoning process? And so the Cumming Center is a really good example of an area that was industrial that we were able to essentially revitalize into the, I'm not sure if it's the largest employment center on the North Shore, but I know it is one of the largest employment centers and a big reason of why we're just behind Salem, I think then Peabody, Lynn and us as the fourth largest employment center on the North shore, which is huge for Beverly's economy. Obviously that's commercial tax revenue for the city. Uh, but that was a really creative way to, with a vision in mind, rezone an industrial plot that was underutilized and maximize its value to the city. I think what we would wanna do is, and obviously again, this is case by case basis, really hone in on this mixed zoning model of how do we meet expansion of commercial needs for the city if we can bring in businesses to utilize existing buildings or at least existing parcels with the same, you know, or similar size footprint if a new building's being put into place, while then also incorporating multifamily housing within the unit that would require, um, and this is something that the state incentivizes. So as far as how do we do this, um, one of the provisions of state law, chapter 40 R talks a lot about this new idea of smart growth and mixed use zoning is at the core of how do you maximize space to meet both commercial and housing needs within the same properties. Um, I'd have to do a little more research as to what the financial incentives to the city are, but I do believe that there are either grants that the city would be eligible for or 
some sort of tax breaks available to the developers if they meet this smart growth zoning criteria. And so I think that's a way that we could kind of kickstart a proactive process on the city's end for looking at parcels that are currently underutilized based on their zoning, you know, if it's an outdated industrial property, and then proactively going forth with a vision of what we would ideally like to see starting from the zoning process so that we're not just kind of aimlessly rezoning without much of a vision in mind, we can rezone to then draw in the type of development that we would like to see for the area based on how it's zoned. Uh, this is something I've actually- that, uh, We could work on is uh, Folly Hill. Uh, that's mm. been thrashing around for a number of years of, yeah, we're gonna do something. No, we're not, yes, we are. It's, can't handle the traffic in the neighborhood. And, you know, lots of reasons keep coming up. So I guess as a counselor at large, um, you would you get involved with, uh, <clears throat> how do you look at the big picture for the city? And what's the best thing to do for an area like you've been talking about, like uh, Folly Hill, that has got a lot of potential. It's very close to 128, so mm -hmm. it can attract businesses. But at the same time, uh, the people that work at Folly Hill should be able to live reasonably close. So there's your opportunity, I think, for uh, mixed use development. Yep. Having both uh, the right kind of uh, industrial and at the same time, reasonable housing within distance. Don't want to turn it into a mill village, but because uh, I remember exactly. those from Rhode Island, but uh, it's not too bad an example of uh, where I think we need to go. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, this is ultimately what drove me to get involved in the planning board. And now I'm excited that I have the opportunity to take those experiences and jump into this race um, because at the end of the day, the city council is the real driver of this policy, uh, the policy making process on this end. But yeah, I do think, and I think this is an area that there's consensus in the city, at least from the folks I've talked about, talked to about this issue with. Um, so these are conversations that need to be had. I think the biggest thing now is how do we translate seemingly overly bureaucratic zoning processes into a policy making process that the city can get involved in where we can articulate a vision with consensus from members of, you know, all different stakeholders within the city about how do we make use of underutilized properties in the city to meet our housing needs, to continue to grow on our economic development success that we've had, which, you know, a lot of communities envy. They don't have the ability to raise revenue through bringing in commercial, new commercial industries like Beverly does. Um, that's a benefit to the city financially, but then also to the vitality of our community. Um, and so these are just things that we have to be proactive about. And that's really one area that I think I can be a success, successful counselor, having had experience and exposure through the planning board, but just through my work in municipal government uh, with the town of Reading, that these are areas I'm familiar with. And I believe I can be an effective counselor in immediately pushing the drive for incorporating some of these zoning reforms that allow mixed use zoning when we think about what we want to implement from the master plan in the next five to 10 years. Well, right now there's a charter commission that's yep. thrashing out, what do we do next? And uh, the last charter commission made a dramatic change from a uh, mm -hmm. more of a balanced uh, government to one of a strong mayor, uh, weak city council. Yep. Um, and the things you're talking about require a lot of initiative from the city councilors, especially the councilors at large, mm -hmm. to look at the big picture of the city and um, what's the, the right balance. And I can understand a ward councilor says, hey, not in my ward, but at the yeah. same time, uh, the city councilors at large need to say, hey, this is what we need for the city. Mm -hmm. So what would you be in favor of in a different kind of uh, charter or amendments to the charter? Um, well, to just focus on this matter, I think within the current framework of the charter, which as you mentioned, we live in a small mayor city or a strong mayor city where the mayor is a clearly empowered chief executive and 
the legislative duties are delegated to the city council, but at the local level, at the end of the day, the executive is really, you know, the one driving the truck. And yeah. so I do believe with how the charter is written, there is an ability for the city council to lead on this issue. Um, I think one being that any zoning ordinance change is going to go through the city council. And so the mayor can lead an initiative like the mayoral administration just did with the master plan to kind of set the tone as far as the vision goes. But bringing consensus really starts at the city council um, as far as resident consensus goes with any zoning change starts at the city council because we as city council members would be the ones most in tune with residents' concerns because essentially that's what we are elected to be the direct representative of residents to city council or to the city council and the business of the city, whereas the mayor is elected to be the chief executive focusing on the administration of the city. Um, that brings up the issue that you brought up earlier of what about the development along Bass River? From mm -hmm. what I've seen in the meetings I've attended as part of the uh, Plan Beverly, uh, they're talking about uh, condos, apartments uh, in the proximity of the uh, railroad station and yep. continuing more of the same. But what I hear you saying is we need to think about that area in a much broader uh, perspective relative to the real needs of the city in terms of other kinds of uh, development. And uh, like it or not, riverfront property is intuitively very expensive and attractive. Yeah. So now we get into the, the issue of uh, how do you balance that? And again, with the, the limited uh, initiative in the city council. Mm -hmm. So I think there's two things here. One, the challenge in Beverly and anywhere in the great ring of greater Boston is the property values are very expensive. So as you mentioned, you have riverfront property that's going to be an expensive piece of property that a developer is inherently going to want to build a higher priced unit on to maximize their return. Yeah, he's and so, get his return. yeah, I do think this is where for two things, one where the city council and they both come back to this role that the city council has in articulating a longer term vision for the city. I think that is the most important role, especially that a council at large serves is by listening to residents, hearing their concerns, and talking with them about what the future of the city should look like. They're the ones that have to go and say, this is what I've heard from residents about where they want Beverly to go. That's a very important role of the city council. It's its core function essentially through these legislative actions that we take, we are dictating the future of the city. And when you think about the Bass River and what could potentially go there versus you know, some of the things that we've discussed that would make a lot of sense meet the needs of the city uh, with smaller mixed use development, if that's something that the city council, and obviously we want to get input from residents. I've been talking to folks about that development in particular, but development in the city in general. And obviously one thing that I really want to emphasize in my campaign is making sure that folks are being heard on not the, not only this issue, but issues in our city across the board. And by then bringing those voices to the table as city councilors, we can articulate a vision where let's say we end up in a scenario that the mayor I'm not saying that he would. I haven't talked at length with him about this issue yet, um, although the matter has been discussed and I do believe it's one that we're going to tackle in the coming years. Um, if the mayor for some reason came with another six-story apartment building, it would be the role of the city council to say that doesn't meet the need of our city. We would rather see smaller mixed-use development that still provides reasonably priced units. And as the city council, if we're able to then lead on that with the backing of the voices from residents who have weighed in on this issue, I think that would make a big difference as far as setting the tone in the policy making process goes. That's something that can happen within the way that the charter is currently constructed and the powers that the city council is given. Um, and then on the other end, a uh, little bit on the financial side, I think this is where we really just need to be proactive in utilizing resources from the state. Um, the governor and his administration have made pretty clear that they want to see an increase in this workforce housing um, and just a greater housing stock for middle income residents across the state. And so by utilizing some of the tax credits available and you know, maybe incentivizing developers to look on that end, but also any sort of community benefits that we could receive by meeting some of these housing needs, which are needed regionally, 
in greater Boston, you could argue even broader across the entire Commonwealth, uh, there would be some resources at our disposal to try to offset the natural, you know, I guess the way that from a strictly dollars and cents standpoint, a developer is going to say, this is valuable. If I can outbid everybody else and get this property, I'm going to put the most expensive apartment building I can in order to then reap the rewards of high rents. Um, yeah, so I guess we get to the point of uh, you're talking about a campaign and we're running out of uh, our half hour of mm -hmm. showtime. So your turn to speak directly to the audience and tell them what you think is they should know about you. Yeah, thanks, George. Um, and I do appreciate this time to talk with you and making sure that the campaign is focused on these issues. And that's really what's most important about local campaigns or the chance to discuss the issues that are important in our city right now and map out our longer term future. Uh, for me, and again, my name's Brendan Sweeney. I'm a candidate for city councilor at large. The reason that I'm running and what I feel I bring to the city is kind of derived from these th three core pillars. Um, and the first, which we've really discussed a lot about is that the future of our city for the next five to 10 years is gonna depend on the decisions that we make now which I believe is even more amplified than our normal biennial elections because we're coming right out of the COVID-19 pandemic in a situation that we need to make sure that we're rebuilding, that our business community is stabilized and that we can get back on track as far as housing and commercial development in the city go. Then when you look at, as we discussed at the beginning of the call, we're losing two longtime city councilors that bring years of institutional knowledge and so to have a new council come in at this important juncture, it's really critical that we have counselors who know how local government in particular operates, but state government as well, the interplay between the two. Um, and that's an area that's a real strength for me, given my background working in local government management in Reading, um, my role working on crafting the state budget, specifically housing and economic development policy. Those are two areas there where understanding how things work at the state level will pay off in my role as a city councilor in Beverly when we talk about some of these rezoning initiatives and other incentives that the city has available from the state. And then my role now is working with uh, cities and towns in distributing COVID aid, but more so working with them to help their immediate response measures be effective, which I would say for many municipalities, they were able to meet that need over the past year. And now we're shifting to working on longer term COVID recovery initiatives. And so I've had that direct experience working with mayors and town managers throughout the length of this COVID pandemic. And now I've been working with them to help situate their cities and towns moving forward. That's an experience that I can immediately bring into this role as city councilor when we need to do the exact same thing here in Beverly. And then thirdly, um, as you know, George, you mentioned at the beginning, I'm not from Beverly originally, I'm from Ipswich, which isn't too far down the road, but I chose to live in Beverly after college and my fiance and I have chosen Beverly to raise as the place where we would want to raise our family. And so having this personal stake in the city's future as somebody that plans to be here for a while to send kids through the school system, to stay in this community and to really give back and contribute. That's something that drove me when the opportunity came up originally from Paul, um, deciding to step back, but now with Tim and the larger scale turnover on the city council, I do believe I can get back to this community in this role. Um, and also in the same time, represent a demographic as a younger professional that otherwise hasn't been a voice at the table. And I think as we think about our longer term future as a city, it's really important that we do bring folks in my shoes who are younger, who are renters, um, want to stay in the city, but face financial challenges in doing so to the decision-making table when we try to map out where Beverly needs to go as a city. Sounds good. And uh, as we run out of time, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching. And uh, Brendan, we'll probably would have another discussion sometime in the near future as this campaign goes on. Because Of course, this looking is forward the, to it. This is the ongoing election season and it's going to be fun. Thanks for Definitely. joining us and thanks for watching, ladies and gentlemen. We'll talk to you later. Thank you, George.